Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Hey everyone, it's Amanda. So I'm doing my April 2021 bullet journal setup and plan with me today. The video that you're about to see is a little bit different from my typical plan with me videos. Um, I'm actually going to be talking almost like podcast style about my thoughts, um, about my experiences being an Asian creator, especially in the wake of all of the anti-Asian violence and racism. So that's what you guys will be hearing. Obviously, you'll still be seeing my bullet journal setup and everything, but it won't be like my typical video where I narrate every pencil stroke in every box that I draw, which honestly at this point I think is fine because you guys have seen me set up my bullet journal setup tons of times. So pretty sure most of you guys know what I'm doing at this point. I know most of you guys will be very supportive and encouraging about this video. So thank you in advance. But with that being said, let's just get started with the setup. Alright, so the bullet journal theme I decided on for April is this black and white bamboo forest theme which was inspired by traditional Chinese ink paintings. And the reason why I chose this is because it actually relates to what I wanted to talk about in my voiceover today, which is my Asian identity and experience as well as the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and violence. So of course, just as a trigger warning before this video, if you don't want to hear about any of this, then you know, maybe mute it. Um, of course, with all of this, I'm going to be getting into some pretty serious topics. So if you haven't been seeing what's been going on in the news recently, there's been a rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and violence both in America and Canada. And just as some statistics for you, yes, I'm pulling out the statistics, from 2019 to 2020, while overall hate crime has declined by 7%, hate crimes targeting Asians specifically has increased by nearly 150% in America. And in Canada, it's increased by six or 700 times in major cities. And these incidents involve people being coughed on, spat on, physically and verbally assaulted, and of course, as we've seen in the news recently in Atlanta, actually being killed. So yes, a lot of this is a result of the racist rhetoric in the news, regarding the pandemic over the past year, you know, a certain someone calling it the Chinese flu. But I think it's really important to point out that a lot of it is just exposing a very deep history of anti-Asian racism and Sinophobia that has existed in the West for centuries. I mean, the way the West has talked about China even before the pandemic was often shrouded in hatred or fear. And you always hear about this looming presence of communist China as if they're trying to invade, which has instilled a really scary and mysterious picture of China in people's minds. And it affects the Asian community today. So throughout history, you can see this systematically in the Chinese Exclusion Act, which happened in both Canada and America, the Japanese internment camps, the Chinese head, head tax in Canada, where every person immigrating from China had to pay a fee in order to enter the country. And as a note, no other group in Canada has ever been forced to pay a fee based upon where they're from. Um, I don't want to take this entire voiceover to talk about statistics and history and all of that because, of course, you didn't necessarily click this video to hear about that. However, you do come to my videos for me and what I create, my art and my journaling, and my Asian identity is a big part of a lot of that. For those of you who don't know about my background, which is apparently a lot of people, because when I Google search my name, the first thing, like one of the first things that pops up is Amanda Rachley ethnicity. <laughs> but anyway, I am a third generation Chinese Canadian. So my grandparents were born in China and then immigrated here to Canada. And growing up, my Asian identity was kind of confusing because on one hand, I was clearly Chinese. Both my parents are Chinese. I look Chinese. However, on the other hand, 
I didn't feel Chinese at all. I was born in Canada. My parents speak fully fluent English, which meant I, of course, spoke no Chinese at all. And I just grew up like any Canadian child, so I really didn't connect to my Chinese side at all. Um, and I actually almost started to resent that side of me, which is something I'm not very proud of, and it breaks my heart thinking back to the way that I used to think about my own culture and identity at the time. I think I definitely had a lot of internalized racism. I just remember wishing I could be white because in my head, I was pretty much already there. And I know that this is something that a lot of children of immigrants go through, that feeling of being in between two worlds, never fully accepted by either. For me, this was extremely evident in my life, even as recent as high school. I was lucky enough to go to schools that were pretty diverse, and I would say that my high school had actually quite a lot of Asians. So I was surrounded by Asians, but even then, there were times that I felt left out of my Asian friends because since I was a third generation, Chinese Canadian and most of them were second generation, a lot of them spoke their respective home languages and I only spoke English. Um, additionally, I chose a career path in the creative industries, whereas typically, you know, Asians are associated with being doctors or lawyers or engineers. And granted, a lot of that is pressure from parents and society and all of that, but a lot of people would joke that I'm a whitewashed Asian and I would even make that joke myself I think mostly as a way to dismiss it and join in on the joke and laugh with people but guiltily I think sometimes I would even take pride in someone calling me whitewashed or someone asking me whether I was mixed half Chinese half white and it's really comes from that idea of whiteness being the ultimate form or the something to aspire to be um, and the fact that people saw that in me was almost like a badge of assimilation. Obviously now I think that's so sad. I wish I spoke Chinese and I wish I had made more of an effort to connect to my culture growing up. And this is something that I'm still working through and it's something that I'll have to navigate for the rest of my life as an Asian woman. Um, as I mentioned, I felt left out from my Asian friends, but of course I did not 100% fit in with non-Asians either. I mean, clearly because of the way I looked, I'm clearly Asian. But a lot of this was also because of the microaggressions that I would face on a daily basis. If you don't know what microaggressions are, they are subtle and indirect expressions of racism or white superiority, kind of casual and disguised and they're really common, so common that they're often dismissed or played off as jokes. And even though the name has micro in it, these small statements can actually build up to have a really large effect on minority groups. And I have, of course, dealt with all kinds of these microaggressions and jokes between people coming up to me and literally singing ching chong to my face, to people pulling back their eyes, or to people asking me where I'm really from. There are so many microaggressions that minorities deal with on a daily basis. I actually found a couple really great academic papers that go through the main themes amongst microaggressions. I won't go through all of them, but the first main one is the idea of being an alien in your own land or country, and it comes from the idea that all Asians or people of color were born in foreign countries. And in, in everyday life, this manifests in the question that I think pretty much every person of color has been asked in their life. It's the, oh, you know, where are you from? And then ultimately, when I say I'm from Canada, you get hit with the, no, but like, where are you really from? And although most of the times it's from someone who's really well-intentioned, taking interest in your background, the way it's expressed makes it sound like I'm not a real Canadian, despite the fact that I was literally born here and I've never gone to China in my life. <laughs> By the way, if you're wondering how to ask that question, uh, try asking someone what their background is or what their ethnicity is instead of asking them where they're from. Another microaggression theme is the denial of race in general, which is seen in the very common statements like, Oh, I don't see color. There's only one race, the human race. And this just denies a person of color's cultural, culture and racial experiences. We're not asking people to be colorblind. It's more so like seeing color, 
but then accepting it and acknowledging it. Another example of this is when people deny that race plays a role in people's success. I've heard this in my own life through debates that I've had about diversity initiatives in companies. People will say things like, well, you know, the most qualified person should get the job. They shouldn't just get it because they're a person of color or everyone can succeed in this society if they just work hard enough. And the implication there is that if a person of color does get the job or gets chosen, then per perhaps they were given unfair benefits and were only chosen because of their race. Um, but it also insinuates that the white counterpart was probably a better fit or better quali qualified. And it just diminishes the very real barriers that people of color face in society in order to succeed. A lot of times when microaggressions like this would happen to me, I would brush it off or even gaslight myself saying that it wasn't that big of a deal or it's not worth it to make a fuss. Um, and I think many Asians are discouraged to speak up about any discrimination or problems that they face. And it comes from this idea, this instilled idea from families not to rock the boat. Over the years, Asian immigrants have tried their best to assimilate and to be accepted in the West, even taking on jobs that nobody else wanted and not causing a fuss. However, this passiveness has eventually evolved and now it's used against us as well as other minority groups. For example, pitting the black community against the Asian community and using Asians as a scapegoat to blame the black community for not being able to succeed in today's society. You know, they say that you're just not trying enough. Look at the Asians, they're doing so well here. And this is called the model minority myth. Uh, there's this assumption that all Asians are high earners and have succeeded in the West, diminishing any racism or barriers that they have faced. However, for example, in America, Asians actually have the largest income gap between wealthy and poor amongst minority groups. There is a 12.3% poverty rate amongst Asians, which proves that, you know, Asians aren't a monolith. There's not one type of Asian experience and the fact that that one type of experience is used against us and other minority groups, it's awful. One more thing that I wanted to talk about is the fetishization of Asian women. Due to the history of war and hypersexualization of Asian women, it has resulted in this idea that Asian women are submissive and that they make great wives because they don't talk back. At one point, Asian women were even portrayed as the antithesis of a white feminist. In a 1990 GQ article, it described the typical Asian woman as someone who quote-unquote doesn't in insist on being treated like a person. She's there when you need leave from those angry feminists, end quote. I don't think I need to explain why that's messed up, but to this day, men are extremely open and forthcoming about their Asian fetishes not even seeing them as humans, it's more so like an object of conquest. And you can now see how there's a definite link between this history and the shootings that happened in Atlanta this week, or last week, where a man specifically targeted an Asian spa after citing blame for his sexual addiction. Okay, I know I've been spewing a lot of information, which I definitely wanted this video to have a lot of useful information for you guys to learn from, but I, back to my personal experience, I wanted to talk about my experience as an Asian creator on YouTube in specific. Um, I've never really talked about this too much before and I contemplated whether I wanted to bring it up because it is kind of hard for me to talk about, but if you go back to my old bullet journal videos, you'll see that I never showed my face in the beginning of them. I didn't even film an intro. And in the past, around the 2017 to 2018 period, my face was never put on the thumbnails of my videos. And that was actually partially intentional. This was a real conversation that I had with my YouTube manager. We discussed that it might be smarter to not put my face in thumbnails so that people don't discriminate when they're clicking videos if they had seen an Asian face. Obviously, eventually, you know, I started incorporating myself more into videos and now you guys see my vlogs and sometimes I put myself in thumbnails and stuff, but that was after a substantial audience had been built 
And you know, I think to this day, it still kind of sticks in the back of my mind that my most viewed videos are some of the ones where my face doesn't show at all in the thumbnail or in the video. And of course, race might not have anything to do with it, but it really does suck to have to wonder whether I could be more successful if I was white or if I wasn't chosen for specific jobs or sponsorships because of my race. And I think it's important to acknowledge my privilege in this situation too, because even in the videos where I am drawing and only my hands are showing, my skin tone, my hands are pale and fair. And I wonder if my skin tone had been darker, would the videos have done just as well? I don't know, but I just do know that in like stationary advertisements or on Instagram, the recommended on Pinterest or in media, the hands that you see, like the hand models for everything are white hands. Anyway, so let's take it back to the present day since we're coming up to the end of my setup here. I think this is the last spread or two. I wanted to talk about something that I had actually made an Instagram story about. If you didn't see it, I basically said, I wish more of the stationary community would speak up about the recent rise in hate crimes against Asians. Just because so much of the stationery that people use are Japanese or borrowed from traditional Asian calligraphy and art. I mean, I can't even list all of the Japanese stationery brands that exist because honestly, it's pretty much all of them. You have Muji, Pilot, Tombow, Kuretake, Zebra, uh, Hobonichi and the Traveler's Company and way more. Not to mention that washi tape is literally a Japanese word that we've borrowed and have used as a term today. And then of course you have the brush pens that people love and use in calligraphy and those are based on traditional Asian calligraphy practice with a brush. I guess I'm going into another history lesson but this is a calligraphy history lesson so it's fun. <laughs> but Basically, historically, Western calligraphy and typography was done with a hammer, chisel, and stone, or a broad nib pen, whereas Chinese calligraphy is where you will see the brush calligraphy, and that was the tool that was used in a lot of their pieces. Additionally, Chinese calligraphy placed a lot of value on individual style and improvisation, whereas in the Latin lettering, there was an ideal structure and geometry was valued. Um, in Chinese calligraphy, it's seen not so much as achieving perfection or an ideal form, but almost like a record of a specific moment, as well as a practice that encourages meditation, observation, and calm energy. It was really seen as a true art form in Asia, which is why to this day, historians know the names of a lot of famous calligraphers from China. And this was very different from the Western calligrapher or typographer, which was viewed as more of a utilitarian tradesperson since most of their work involved copying manuscripts. And I think it's pretty fair to say that a lot of modern hand lettering today between artists and hobbyists take on a lot of those ideals from Chinese calligraphy, with it becoming more of a self-care, relaxing hobby versus something that is done out of necessity like it was in Western calligraphy historically. Obviously, you know, a lot of calligraphy today is also based on Western calligraphy with like the fountain pen and Gothic forms of letters, but I think that individual expression and the more artistic aspect of it has really manifested itself today with all of the beautiful stylings of lettering and calligraphy that you see on Instagram and Pinterest and people really taking on that idea of it being an art form. As you can see in my bullet journal setup this month, I used Japanese ink and an actual brush to honor this beautiful history of calligraphy art in Asian culture. And as I was doing it, I almost found myself in a meditative state while I was painting the bamboo leaves. So I can definitely connect to that historical side of traditional calligraphy painting and art. 
All that to say, you know, not that people should need a reason to speak up about racism, but it's just this cherry picking of Asian culture that bothers me. I forgot where I had read this, but it's almost like people are at a buffet and they're choosing what aspects they like from Asian culture without even actually appreciating the history or acknowledging the negative history associated with Asian culture. People will gladly take what Asian culture provides, whether it be sushi, anime, K-pop, yoga, bubble tea, or stationery, but not ever fully accept us or speak up for us when we are in need. And since, you know, we're at the last spread here in my bullet journal setup, this is the part where I really want to ask you to take notice of who's speaking up at this time. Um, you guys have currency in the form of who you give a platform and I'm very grateful that you guys have given me a platform and that I'm able to speak up about this stuff because it, I, I am very proud that I'm able to connect with a lot of people. One of my favorite things is when I get comments from other Asian girls saying that they were inspired to join a creative field because of me and stuff like that. So I really don't take this platform and privilege that I've been given lightly and I hope other creators don't as well. Um, well, okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening to me blab about all of this. I really worked hard on researching things and making sure that I gave you guys interesting and helpful information. You might be asking, okay, Amanda, after all of that, what can I do to help? And honestly, I know you guys have seen all those Instagram infographics of stuff. And of course, I will be linking resources like that down below that you guys can share. Um, but I'll also be linking all the sources that I used to research everything and places to donate as well. But really, right now, one of the best things that you can do is listen to Asian voices as well as look inwards. Many times people get defensive or shut down when confronted with their own action. But one of the greatest ways to learn is acknowledging whether you or someone in your life has done something that could negatively affect minorities, even if it's unknowingly, like the microaggressions that I mentioned in this video. So speak up if you see someone else making those uncomfortable jokes, if it's in your workplace or your family. Don't just chalk it up to someone not meaning any harm. Um, what else? Oh, you can support your local Asian businesses. I've been so worried about all of the Asian-owned restaurants who have been taking a hit during this pandemic because of that misconception that Asian food, you know, Asians eat bats and if you eat Asian food, you'll get the virus. It's a very real thing that people have been spreading and not only do the Asian owners of these businesses and restaurants have to fear for their safety now with everything going on, but that on top of the financial hit that the pandemic has given them, it's it's been really worrying and I, I hope that a lot of my favorite Asian businesses and restaurants will survive after the pandemic. And of course, please spread awareness, especially if you think your circle reaches a lot of non-Asian people. I always worry about things becoming a bit echo chambery, especially uh, in my community, and that all of this awareness and information is not reaching the people that probably need to hear it the most. Uh, this is why we need non-Asian allies so much at this time. So, wow, that was a lot. <laughs> I know this voiceover was heavy. There was a lot of information. And for myself, I knew that this was a video that I wanted and needed to make. So it was really fulfilling to research a lot and even thinking about what I wanted to talk about in this voiceover. It was a little bit emotional because I really had to unlock a lot of my childhood past growing up, my experiences as an Asian woman. So it was a very interesting video to make and I hope you guys took something from it. Thank you, if anything, just for listening to me talk about it. I really, really do appreciate that. Oh, and hopefully you also enjoyed watching the setup as well. I know I didn't talk about it too much in the video, but I really did like how this setup and theme turned out. I love the grayscale, inky look to it, and I think it just looks very elegant and it was calming to make as well. 
Before I show you guys the final flip through of my bullet journal setup, I wanted to talk a little bit about today's sponsor, Skillshare. If you guys don't already know about Skillshare, they are an awesome online learning community with thousands of really inspiring classes and they're all geared towards creative and curious people, which I know all of you guys are. They have tons of classes about design, illustration, business, technology, you name it, they probably have a class for it. I try to take new Skillshare classes regularly so that I can keep learning and expanding my skills and that way I can apply it into anything creative that I do, whether it be my art or my videos or my bullet journal setups. You guys always ask me how I get inspiration and how I stay motivated to be creative and I think learning new things is a really big part of that. Of course, a lot of you guys already know this, but I do actually have a bunch of classes on Skillshare Share that are exclusive to their platform. I have classes on creative journaling, art journaling for mental wellness. I have class on journaling your affirmations with a little bit of a lettering workshop thrown in there as well. So um, if you guys wanna see more content from me, then Skillshare is the perfect platform for that. I definitely go a little bit more in depth than I do on my channel here just because that platform allows for it. And that's one of the things that I do love about the platform itself is just through all the diverse classes and teachers and projects and discussion boards, it really encourages a community and encourages supporting fellow creatives. Also, they're always launching new premium content, so you'll always have something to check out if it piques your curiosity and it is curated for learning, meaning there's no ads. You're really focused in on the class that you're taking and the projects that you're doing. So if you guys are interested in trying out Skillshare for yourself, premium membership is less than $10 a month, but Skillshare was kind enough to offer my viewers the Lil Doodles a special deal. So the first thousand subscribers of mine who click the link in my description box down below will get 30% off an annual premium membership. and. Something to note, if you've already done the free trial offer, you can still take advantage of this deal, which is awesome. As always, a huge thank you to Skillshare. They've always been very supportive of me and my channel and big friend to the channel. So check them out in the description box down below if you guys want to learn some new things. And finally, here's the full flip through of my April 2021 bullet journal setup, which was my homage to traditional Asian ink paintings and calligraphy. I think it turned out so beautiful and it was just so relaxing and fun to make. All right guys, so that's it for my bullet journal setup. I know it's a little bit of a different format than what I usually do, but hopefully you enjoyed hearing my thoughts and maybe it made you think about some stuff on your own. Of course, I will be leaving a bunch of links and resources and places to donate down below. I really, really encourage you to check some of those out. And if you are able to donate, it would really mean a lot to me. And just all in all, let's be nice to each other. Let's be understanding, keep listening to people's stories. Um, I do want Want to showcase some of your guys's recreations from last month as i always do if you do want to be featured in my future video then make sure you tag me on instagram at amanda h lee just tag me in the photo of your recreations whether it be from this month or previous month's setups and then of course as always if you do want to see the rest of my weekly spread setups then come hang out on twitch every saturday at 11 a.m eastern time i set up my weekly spreads live and it's a nice chill little community. Anyway, I hope you're all taking care of yourself. Keep doodling and I will talk to you in the next one. Bye everyone.